Hi, everyone. My name is Colin Morrison, and I'm coming to you from the University of Texas at Austin, where I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of Integrative Biology. So I'm here today because I was fortunate enough to be one of this year's recipients of the Graduate Student Research Enhancement Award. So I'm looking forward to sharing with you about my dissertation work, about the study system that I work in, and uh, talk a bit at the end about how the GSRA is going to um, play into all the rest of the core work that I'm doing. So the system I work on is the passion bind system, the passiflora. And the reason that this system is interesting for me to look at um, questions about the ecology, evolution, basic entomology of host plant specialization is that there's two groups of distantly related insects that simultaneously specialize on all the given passifloras within a community, which makes a really interesting system to ask some comparative questions about how their ecologies, their biologies um, facilitate the fact that they can coexist in the way that they do. So I'll start off with a little outline of what we're going to do today. I'll begin with an introduction to the passion vine system and discuss my motivation for working within it. Next, I'll briefly go over my dissertation projects, a couple of my dissertation projects, and talk about how they get back to answering those questions about why simultaneous dietary specialization on this genus of plants persists. And then I'll finish up with talking about my goals with the GSREA and um, where we're at with that now and where we are going to be moving forward. So I work on passion vine insects at three sites. I have a site down in Costa Rica, La Selva Biological Reserve. I also work in the Rio Grande Valley of South Texas, as well as um, up in the hill country of Central Texas and the deciduous hardwood forests of East Texas. And the reason that these um, that these sites are good for me is because you know they're they're tractable. I have some infrastructure there and some history, but they all three have discrete communities of passion vines, passion vine specialist flea beetles, and heliconians with which I can do experiments and make some comparisons. So I'll draw your attention to the right hand side of the graph now, where I've got this graphic of what I will call the phytochemical landscape, termed by Mark Hunter in 2016. And this is a cool conceptual framework that I like to think about when um, investigating host plant specialization, because it involves these three non-mutually exclusive parts, the trophic interactions, herbivory, natural enemy interactions, phytochemical variation in the plants, and then the availability of nutrients in the system, which will affect the uh, the variability of phytochemistry and often indirectly affect the trophic interactions in any way you could imagine. So keep that in mind as we start moving forward through these dissertation chapters. So the passion vines are predominantly distributed in the uh, New World tropics and North America. And here I've got several images of uh, passion vines from La Selva that I think really characterize the, the variation at many levels that exist in this genus. They vary from each other morphologically, there's different habitat preferences. They have different associations with mutuals ants that tend extra floral nectaries and defend the plants from herbivory. And they vary a lot in their chemistry, especially with respect to a class of compounds called cyanogenic glycosides, which are known to be one of the primary reasons that not many things eat passion vines and those that do specialize on it, presumably because they've co-evolved with the plants in a diffuse way. The first group I'll talk about is the passion vine flea beetles because this is the Coleopteris Society. The flea beetles are a great group to work with because they are um, fairly easy to rear and to keep in captivity. And they're, they're, um, they're all over the place at my field sites. They're characterized by a lot of variation too and their life histories and their behavior, but generally they're postsomatically colored and preliminary data that I've worked on has shown that indeed they are co-opting cyanogenic glycosides presumably for their own defense in the same way that Heliconius caterpillars have been known to do so for a while. This makes a nice system to compare the two <clears throat> and how they're doing it and how that uh, results in competition or lack thereof so that these organisms um, continue to persist together in sympatry. This is the, the level that really kind of brings my thoughts together on how the, the, the simultaneous dietary specialization can exist is by looking at these food web networks. And you'll see that they're fairly complex, but there's a lot of really cool information in here based off of decades of natural history done by <clears throat> my advisor and other, and other associates of the lab that give us a really strong base from which we can take information about performance or natural en enemy interactions or plant traits 
and develop some testable hypotheses to figure out why this uh, dietary specialization exists in a comparative framework. So we'll go through my dissertation chapters, a couple of my dissertation chapters uh, briefly, and I'll talk about how they apply back to understanding these communities and the phytochemical landscape. So the first chapters, I'll, the first chapter I'll talk about is just performance, classic performance experiments with uh, flea beetles and heliconions. We're able to do this because we have a very nice facility at UT Austin where we've been cultivating native and exotic passion vines for many years. So we take those plants, we rear caterpillars and beetle larvae on them, and we get metrics like uh, developmental time here on the left of these zebra long wing caterpillars. And you can see that there's statistically significant differences in how long it takes these caterpillars to go from uh, larva to adult on different host plants. Similarly, on the right, Dysonica stenostica, the, uh, the plant they eat predicts the amount of mass they're gonna attain, which is presumably gonna affect their, their, their fecundity and by virtue of their fitness. I've got this kind of data for a bunch of different species. This is just a couple of examples of the kind of um, trophic interactions performance work that I've, been on, that I've been on. Next is thinking about the interactions with these specialist insects and their natural enemies, like parasitoids. So, Parasitoid assays are really difficult to accomplish um, in a lab or in a field because they're just finicky in my experience. So what we've done is developed a, a proxy where we take um, fishing line and then we insert the fishing line into larvae, leave it in there for a day so that the immune response of the beetle or the caterpillar is triggered. And what they're gonna do is that they're gonna attach melanin to those filaments as a foreign object, similarly to a braconid or a chalcid egg laid inside the tissue to try to asphyxiate it so that the larva doesn't eclose and begin to consume the tissue. What we see here from these assays is that you get some variation in <clears throat> how uh, the level at which filaments get melanized depending on the host plant that uh, generalist species eat, as well as some differences between specialist and uh, generalist species, as we see here on the right with the Passiflora flea beetle. These specialists have a statistically significant um, they're, they, they're, they're, they're melanizing filaments less than generalist beetles from the same habitat. Next, I'm gonna talk about um, some of the analyses I've been working on a lot recently to get at those community level questions of how is there all this coexistence and assemblages of, of beetles and caterpillars? Um, how is that affected by the traits of the plants as well as the phylogenetic relationships of those plants? So the way to do this is to take all that information in those food web networks that I showed earlier and decompose those into um, dissimilarity indices for all of the herbivores found across the plants in the community. And what you get is the similarity scores shown here in this NMDS plot where the dots are plants, the data input is the herbivores on those plants and the closer they are to one another means the more similar their assemblage structure is. So we've got this for the, for the flea beetles. Also got all this data for the lepidopterans. So here we go. We got some nice response variables that we can look at different passiflora traits as predictors of. Um, first one is the cyanide concentration of the plants because we know that it varies considerably both within certain species and among species in a community. This is all of the passiflora species at La Selva. Another one that I'm really excited about is the chemical profile similarity of plants. And this is, we're talking about the entire chemical profile, the metabolomes of these plants with respect to one another. Where again, in this graph, dots are plants and dots that are more close to one another have more similar chemical profiles to one another. Because, you know, cyanide and specific groups of chemicals are probably important, but they're also ignoring a lot of the rest of it. So this is like the opposite where we're looking at the entire metabolomes and bringing that to bear on the assemblage structure data. We've also got a number of other uh, nice data sets to throw at this, um, specific leaf area, thickness of the plants, trichome density, stickiness of the plants, canopy cover, so uh, a proxy for their um, habitat preference, as well as the level of mutualist ants that are attending these different passiflora species. So here we go with some results. This is the passiflora flea beetle community, and the analysis is called a distance based redundancy analysis, which is a type of ordination that allows us to partition variance in the predictor variables and um, assign statistical significance if they're in fact driving the patterns. So what we see here is that phylogenetic distance of the host plants is a significant predictor of beetle assemblage structure, which isn't a huge surprise because they've been co-evolving with these plants for a long time. And second is that the chemistry of the plants, what the cyanide concentration and the chemical similarity is a very strong predictor of the assemblage structure. 
We get similar results with the Lepidopteran community too, though not quite as strong as with the beetles. So this has gotten us a lot closer to being able to answer the question of what drives assemblage structure in this community. I'm gonna repeat these analyses for the South Texas and the East Texas, Central Texas communities as well. We're really excited. We're gonna to look to publish this stuff soon. So we'll wrap up with uh, my goals for the GSREA. So you might have noticed looking at the food web networks of the, ble of the beetles is that there's no dendrograms, there's no phylogenies attached to these because they don't exist. <laughs> so there are certain questions that I can't answer, certain comparative questions about the evolution of passiflora specialization or ability to co-op cyanide that just can't be answered properly without a phylogeny, molecular phylogeny that's going to contain all the passiflora specialists and their closest relatives that do not eat passiflora. This is hopefully what it's going to look like once we get the data in hand. And we've made good progress in moving towards that. I've got uh, some great collaborators, my friends Lynette Strickland, who's in attendance here today, and Aaron Goodman, as well as uh, Kyle Schnepp at the Florida State Arthropod Collection, who's going to help us big time by filling in a lot of the gaps in the taxon sampling that we don't have yet. But we're looking forward to getting this data out because then we can answer questions like how do different um, do specialists and generalists sequester cyanide differently? We know that heliconiists do. The specialists sequester cyanide at much higher concentrations than the generalists. But we may not get the same results with the flea beetles. These are Dysonica species from um, Costa Rica in the United States. And they are sequestering cyanide at levels that are higher or similar, at least, to what the plants they're eating are. So this is interesting. That's already a big difference from what we're seeing with the heliconiast community. And I'm really excited because we're gonna be able to answer some cool comparative questions with this phylogeny, but we're also just gonna be able to make a nice contribution to helping to resolve the phylogenetic relationships of a economically and aesthetically pleasing group of um, insects, the, the flea beetles. So with that, um, I, I wanna thank all my friends, my, my collaborators, my, um, my committee and my advisor, Larry Gilbert for all the support they've given me and uh, moving forward to answering some cool questions about coleoptera biology and ecology of host plant interactions in general. So I look forward to chatting with you all later um, during the social mixer and um, send me an email if you got any questions. I look forward to chatting. Thanks a lot.